I am delighted to introduce to you Professor Frank Oberclyde. Uh, Professor Frank Oberclyde is our, key, our next keynote speaker, and he is the foundation director of the Center for Community Child Health at the Royal Children's Hospital, and a, prep, and a professor uh, at the University of Melbourne Department of Pediatrics. He is an internationally renowned researcher, having authored two books, numerous book chapters, and over 150 scientific papers on various aspects of pediatrics. For ECD in our region, Professor Oberclyde is a friend, a mentor, and a guide. As a pediatrician, he thinks that young, uh, young children keep you honest and humble because, as he says, every once in a while, a baby will urinate on you. <laughs> so, taking forward strand three of this conference, which is a comprehensive approach to early childhood systems and services, Professor Oberclyde, who is hiding somewhere in the audience, there he is, <laughs> will be speaking about improving outcomes in young children by refocusing community-based service systems. So, over to you. Um, thank you, Deepa, and uh, I do indeed feel sad, but I, I really would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to this um, spectacular city and this wonderful weather, um, and it's <laughs> which I brought with me, people have said. But it's a particular pleasure to be here on, on such important anniversaries of ISSA and Step by Step. And uh, I'm really um, in awe of the work that you do, along with my colleagues in UNICEF. I think collectively uh, you do a wonderful job. And I'd really like to publicly acknowledge the very special work and the very special place that you have in the hearts of children uh, and of their families. So congratulations to you all. Um, as Deep has said, and thank you for that very generous uh, introduction, I wish my mother was in the audience to hear that. Um, I'm a paediatrician, and what I'd like to do in my talk today is to take you through some of the neurobiology that under, and the science that underpins just why your work is of such critical, critical importance. So I just want to look at early childhood development with a slightly broader lens and hopefully give you, uh, as if you needed it, an appreciation that the work you do in your day-to-day -day lives is the, the, the most important work that anybody can do. So this is what I'd like to uh, talk about. Um, talk about the brain development research, and the science tells us very clearly that the early years are critical in shaping development, not just in children, but indeed uh, right through the life course. So what happens in those early years has lifelong consequences, and I'll show you some examples of that. And this has implications for the whole service system, not just early learning, but for pediatrics and children's health, and indeed for all the services that uh, work with children, and I'll take you through that. Uh, we, I would argue we need new models of service delivery, that the way we've organized our services in the past doesn't cut it anymore. This, the science about early childhood development is so, so important that we can't do business as usual. And I'll show you some examples of some of our approaches. Uh, and then finish off by talking how we try and engage all stakeholders, because I really firmly believe that we need to mainstream early childhood development. It's not enough for a group of us out there on the fringes of society, on the fringes of academia, to be doing child development research. We need to mainstream that and make it front and central of all our policy work. So this is what the research tells us, uh, that the early years of a child's life are critical and impacting on a range of outcomes through life, that the environment in which a young child grows up uh, literally sculpts the brain in a way that a sculptor will take clay and mould it and so on, and establishes the trajectory very early on for long-term outcomes, cognitive outcomes, social emotional outcomes and so on. If we want to improve outcomes in adult life, 
the research tells us we have to start very early. And just that fact alone gives us huge leverage now for advocacy for early childhood. And finally, even if we don't care about children, economists are now looking at the data and saying that investing in early childhood is the very best investment that any country can make. So we know that children's development is the result of this complex, dynamic transaction between nature and nurture, this dance between biology and the genes that we're born with and the sort of life experiences that a child has. And this begins at conception, it begins antenatally and continues right through the life course. We can have an impact on biology, but where we can really have a major impact is at the level of the environment where young children develop. So this starts prenatally, before the child is born. So for a long time, when I was a medical student, we used to be taught that the placenta is a barrier between the mother and the child, and it serves to filter out all the bad things. We know that's no longer the case, that placenta is malleable. So if um, the mother is taking medication or drugs or smoking or alcohol or experiences stress, that is transmitted directly into the growing fetus. And the fetus doesn't just absorb th this passively. The fetus adapts to those in utero conditions in, a, in an adaptive way, which is positive in the short term, but has negative consequences long term. So the fetus is making adaptations to the nutritional environment, the hormonal signals, uh, but that has long term consequences. And there's, there's any number of books now. The research around this is just uh, overwhelming and staggering. This is not contested research. This is now generally accepted. And then once the child is born, uh, the, the science now is pretty clear about what happens. So the brain architecture and skills happens in a very systematic, very rigid, bottom-up sequence. The genes program the way uh, children develop, but how it develops depends a lot on the environmental inputs. And those foundations that are laid down in those early years are absolutely critical because the development of later order, more sophisticated cognitive and social emotional skills depend on how solid those foundations are. And the analogy we use is like the foundations of a house. If we put a lot of care into the foundations of a house, the chances are everything that follows will be okay as well. But if we take shortcuts with the foundations because we use cheap cement or cheap secondhand electrical wiring, everything that follows is subsequently at risk. We can go back later on and try and fix it up, but it'll never be as good as if we would have got it right the first time. So the science is very clear to us that both biologically and economically, it's far more effective to get it right the first time than to go back later on and try and remediate. And what happens over time is the child's uh, neural circuits become increasingly rigid and harder to change. So the trajectory for a young child is more and more difficult as time goes on. And any of you in the audience as adults that have tried to learn a skill as an adult, how many of you have tried to learn a musical instrument or a new language or a sport? It's very difficult, um, much, much earlier to start early on. And we know what's really important is the relationships that a young child has with caregivers, with parents, with early years professionals, with siblings, et cetera, et cetera. And nurturing and responsive relationships build that healthy foundation that I was talking about. Uh, that literally sculpts the brain. And again, there's huge amounts of research. This is the collection of books about those early years and the importance of relationships. Where that relationship that a young child has with caregivers is stressful, what happens is that levels of stress go up in the child's environment, cortisol levels go up, and where those stress levels are persistent, that interferes signif significantly with optimal brain development. And again, young children adapt to that. The young child continually adapts to the environment in which he or she finds themselves. So they optimise their functioning in the short term, but that compromises their functioning in the long term. 
So that's not to say we can get rid of stress completely from young children. We can't put them in cotton wool and, and make them stress free. So we conceptualize stress at three levels. One is what we call positive stress. And this is the stress that a young child feels when he or she falls over and hurts themselves, when they feel the pain of an injection when they're immunized, um, when they have a temper tantrum because the parents won't give them dessert until they finish their vegetables. Um, stress levels go up and they come down fairly quickly. And what makes it OK is the presence in that child's life of an adult who makes it OK. So a caring adult buffers the effect of this stress. So when a child falls over and hurts themselves, you pick them up and you cuddle them. So this is an invariable part of a growing up. The next level is what we call tolerable stress. And this is unpredictable stress. This is a stress that a child feels when they're hospitalized, when they're separated from parents, or when there's a death in the family. We see it, unfortunately, tragically in war zones or natural disasters. Um, for many of these children, um, it's, to it's tolerable uh, in the sense that um, somebody in that child's life makes it OK. So in these sort of stressful situations, the best way to make sure the child is OK is to make sure that the adult is OK. Because if the ad adult is OK, then that, they will make it OK for the child. What is not OK for the child is what we call toxic stress. And this is when stress levels in the young child's environment go up and they stay up for a long period of time. And we see this in situations of dysfunctional parenting, of parental substance abuse, drug abuse. We see it in family violence or exposure to violence. We see it in parents with mental health problems. And we see it in extreme poverty. When there's persistent stress, there's high levels of cortisol. And that significantly interferes with brain circuit development. And that can lead to lifelong problems. So toxic stress alters the child's neurobiology. Um, so that, for example, a child who grows up in extreme poverty, um, what happens is the body's physiological systems get reset at a different level. And the example I've got in the slide is in a situation where a child is exposed to violence or is the recipient of violence, he or she becomes hypervigilant. They're always looking around for early warning signs that they're going to be hit or they're going to be in danger. So that's adaptive in the short term. But long term, that child will then have great difficulty with social relationships and great difficulty adjusting to school, for example. But uh, risk is not destiny. This is not invariable that young children growing up with stress turn out to have difficulties later on. So children have individual differences in the way they respond. So we like to think of dandelion children. Dandelion children do well in most environments. And then we talk about orchid children. Orchid children are extremely vulnerable to even what we might consider uh, low levels of stress. So orchid children flourish when everything is OK. But in a stressful environment, they react very, very badly. And these neurobiological changes, the research is becoming very robust now. We're starting to understand exactly what happens to the brains of these children and why then there are long-term consequences. And there are two mechanisms that are hypothesized. Uh, and these are not mutually exclusive. One is biological embedding. That is, the child's brain goes through sensitive periods where the brain is reliant on positive environmental input. And when that doesn't happen, then there are consequences. And the second is cumulative exposure and allostatic load. So children who, over a long period of time, are continually exposed to a difficult environment, uh, that creates wear and tear on biological systems. So the biological embedding is um, these, this notion of sensitive periods where the uh, social and environmental stresses becomes deeply embedded in the neurobiological systems. And that has long-term consequences, consequences. So adults who experience stress in these sensitive times are much more likely to have mental illness and physical illness. They're much more likely to have high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, mental health problems, participate in crime, impulse control, etc., etc. 
or and or children who have cumulative exposure uh, have the same sort of deal. And the longer children are exposed to stressful situations, the higher the chances are of these long-term consequences. And I, as I said before, um, what persistent stress or persistent dysfunctional environment, poor relationships that a young child has within a family, uh, it resets the body's um, immune system, it resets their physiological system, it makes them more prone to infections, to high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look at the range of adult problems, There's a huge number of adult problems that have their roots in young children. And this is also a research literature that is growing week by week, month by month. And what impresses me about this range of conditions is its diversity. That these are the sort of public health issues that, and the social issues that our colleagues in adult health are looking at. Uh, and as this research becomes more robust, that many of these problems begin in the early years, then prevention becomes the only game in town. How do we prevent these from occurring? And the answer is make sure that early childhood is as good as we can make it. So for example, in our country about six or seven years ago, um, the Minister for, for Legal Affairs was concerned about high levels of crime. And she appointed a very high-powered commission of inquiry to look at ways we, could, we can prevent crime. And it was chaired by a very eminent professor of criminology at one of the leading universities. So he chaired an expert group. They took evidence. They took depositions. They looked at the literature. And they published three volumes of a report, which can be summarized in one sentence. If you want to prevent crime, get the early years right. So this creates a very powerful lever for us in our advocacy efforts and is an example of what I was talking about before, that there's an opportunity now for us to begin to try and mainstream our advocacy efforts. This is not just about young children. This is really about um, the future of democratic society. And if we're going to make a difference, the earlier we start, the lower the cost and the higher the efficacy. We have to start at the left-hand side of this graph. And in most countries that I'm aware of, policymakers wait until problems become entrenched and then try and do something about it at a time when the evidence that we can fix it is low and the cost is very high. So all the research is really screaming out at us to begin early in life and begin in those early years. So I'd like to switch to social inequality, that um, this is the biggest risk factor that we all deal with. We've known about the effects of poverty for a long, long time. The difference now is we can understand the, the um, biological mechanisms for why children growing up in poverty uh, have, uh, can have these problems. And these are children that experience what I call double jeopardy that these are families who, cut, who live in poor circumstances who would benefit the most from having family supports and yet are the least likely to receive them. These are children who would benefit the most from going to high quality early learning centres and yet are the least likely to go. Uh, and these are families that often grow up in toxic environments that just compound the problem. So there are two ways in which we address this double jeopardy. One is we need more resources. All of us in every country that we work in keep on arguing for additional resources for children and families. Uh, and we should keep on doing that. But we can't wait until some government says, yep, you're right, we'll give you billions of dollars for uh, children. We have to start to do things differently as well, so that in every community that I've been in, in a number of different countries, where there is an existing service system already in place, there are issues with that service system. So in Australia now, we're starting to focus on that service system. So in our country, and indeed in many of the jurisdictions where you operate, there's already an existing infrastructure of services. There may be different names, you, there may be a different combination, you'll have more, you'll have less, etc., cetera, et cetera. But it's not as if it's a green field site. It's not as if we're beginning from scratch with nothing there. There's lots and lots of services. So our initial 
perception is, well, what's the problem? The services for young children are already there. But we know that there are barriers to using services. Just because services are there does not mean the children and families use them. And indeed, this double jeopardy that I was mentioning, in public health, there's this notion of the inverse care law. Services are much more likely to be used by people who don't need them. And those who need them the most uh, don't use them. So there are structural barriers, there are family level barriers, and there are relationship or interpersonal barriers, which means that uh, children and families don't access the very services that have been established to help them. So we have this sort of fragmentation of services, different colours, different shapes, different sizes. Um, you need a university degree to negotiate your way around these services. And we're talking about some of the most vulnerable families who may have problems with literacy and self-esteem and confidence, etc., etc. So in this service system, there are wrong doors everywhere. Even when a child, when, a, when parents um, work up the courage or organise the logistics to go to one of these services, often they're turned away because the service system doesn't fit the particular needs of that family. And this is an example. This is a very complex slide. This is a child's journey in a community not far from where I work through the service system. We actually mapped a child's journey, trying to negotiate the way between education, health, and welfare. It's impossible. It's such a complex slide. So just imagine what it's like for a family, often with limited resources themselves, often disadvantaged, has a child with some particular problems. Um, it's impossible. And again, there are wrong doors everywhere. We also have problems with the existing service system in terms of the differenti differentiation between primary and secondary and tertiary. Information's one way. The secondary and tertiary services are not co-located with universal services. They're often on the other side of town or even further away. There are long waiting lists. There are narrow eligibility requirements. Um, it's a service, <coughs> the service system uh, in real trouble. So what we should be doing at a minimum is linking up these services. Those of us interested in early childhood have a strong vested interest in uh, all the services that already exist being linked up in some way so that they provide a much better access and services for young children and their families. And that includes the um, con consultative services. So if we can co-locate, that's even better. But we need to bring these closer together as well. So we need to make sure that the specialists are working more closely with the universal services to empower them, to teach them, to push information down, et cetera, et cetera. But what we really should be aiming for is what we call an integrated service system. So we should be really trying to work to a one-stop shop no wrong doors. Everywhere that a young child makes contact with the service system, you've come to the right place. I won't turn you away. Even if I can't solve your problem, even if I don't know what your problem is, I'll make sure that I'll refer you to somebody who can help you. And that's the no wrong door policy. So we would argue we need a different approach. That the research of our brain development is so important that we just can't do things uh, as we did them uh, traditionally. And I would argue that there are a number of different points to, to this different approach, a population-focused strength and capacity. And what I'd like to do is to go through these and just give you some examples of how we're now trying to approach this in an attempt to bring early childhood into mainstream so it becomes front and central uh, for the service system. So first of all, um, the population focus and strengthening the capacity uh, of universal services. So a population approach uh, emphasizes, health, emphasizes health promotion and disease prevention. It has, has a very strong prevention lens. Uh, that means we have to understand systems and the challenge for you and for me is to move outside our narrow lens of what 
whatever particular service we're engaged in and look at the world a little bit more broadly. Look at the service systems that we work in. Now, it also means for policymakers going upstream, looking at the causes of problems, addressing, addressing these underlying social and economic and cultural determinants. And we've heard a lot about these at this conference and some of the work that you're doing here is fantastic. And then it's evidence-based and family-centered. And then what we call, um, what Marmot calls proportionate universalism, which is a terrible term, we call it universal plus. If we're going to make a long-term difference, it means strengthening the universal service system, making a difference for all children. So we, st we should start to think away from reacting to individual children. Even though that's very, very important, that's what I do as a pediatrician. I sit in my hospital um, office, my outpatient clinic, patients come to me. I think I do a good job with them, I try, but we're not going to change the world reacting to individual children. Instead, we need to take a population approach, a preventive approach. We need to move from a focus on individual children towards a focus on all children. So the strength of this tiered system is only as strong as the base of that triangle. And a lot of policy is really focused on children with additional needs or vulnerable children, and that's been the focus for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the answer isn't just throwing more resources at vulnerable children. I believe the answer is strength, strengthening that platform for all children. So we need to make sure that at the bottom of this triangle, 100% of children, 100%, have access to high quality childcare, have access to high quality preschool, have access to good primary health care, etc. And if we can make that very, very solid, then that provides a very important base then for making a difference to vulnerable children. In other words, what we've done in the past is focused on the hard end here, on the, on the right hand side of this curve whether it's child protection, whether it's vulnerability, whether it's mental health, whether it's disability, we're trying to pour money into that hard end. And I would argue there's never going to be enough money there. No matter how much we pour in there, there'll still tragically be cases of child abuse and mental health problems, et cetera, et cetera. What we really should be doing is trying to strengthen services for all children and all families. And then in theory, we'll move the curve over to the left and we sometimes call this population moving strategies, sorry, um, curve moving strategies. We change the distribution curve and then actually decrease the number of children who are vulnerable. Universal Plus takes advantage of the universal, his, universal system. So we're talking about home visiting, community health nurses, childcare, preschool, school, etc., etc. These are what we call soft entry points. That, so there's no stigma attached. So parents that would be reluctant to take their child with a problem or themselves to a problem with, to a tertiary service because there are waiting lists or the other barriers that I showed you before or because there's a stigma attached will take their child to universal services. So if we can start to refashion some of those universal services where professionals work in partnerships with uh, other professionals and particularly where I as a professional take responsibility for the child and the family in front of me. This is no wrong doors. It's not just, I just look after childcare, I'm only interested in early learning, you've got a problem, go somewhere else. And I'll show you some example. And this only works if the community is organised. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. So I would argue that as a paediatrician, not as an early childhood professional, that we need to start to rethink um, ECEC in a number of ways and I think we need to rethink it based on three sets of relationships with children, with parents and with the community. So we, there's been a lot of um, uh, content in this conference about the need for high quality early learning and that's a given. It's even more important now than, we, than when we first thought about this because of the brain development research that the relationships that uh, early years professionals have with children is absolutely crucial. It helps sculpt that brain. It's very, very important. But so is the relationship with parents because the early years professional is the professional that parents come into contact with more than anybody else. They see them in the morning when they drop their children off. They see them again in the afternoon when they um, 
come and pick up their child. So they see the early years professional much more than the nurse or the home visitor or the GP or anybody else. So the opportunity for the early years professional to model for parents, to provide information to them, uh, to pick up clues that things aren't going so well, to refer them, to support them, etc., uh, are just profound. And again, that points to how important training is and how important expertise is. But I would argue also that another important set of relationships is the relationship that early years professionals have with the community. So we try and reconceptualize childcare centers and preschool centers uh, into a platform. It's a soft entry point. So you can refer early to somebody else in the community, provided you know that community, provided you work out partnerships. So it's really important conceptually in our way of thinking that we see early years services as not individual services stand alone, but where they develop partnerships with the community, where they know where the other professionals and where the other agencies uh, are uh, in their surrounding community. And what that means is we have to start to change professional practice. So Dorothy Scott, who in Australia is very interested in child protection, um, she talks about uh, this is the traditional thing. It's not my concern. All I do is uh, look after your child in childcare. All I do is teach your child in preschool. That's the lowest level. Um, what I'm talking about will not work if this remains the attitude. The next level of evolution, sorry, I'm a bit behind, is it's a core role plus referral. Yes, I can see there are problems. Um, I'll refer you because it's somebody else's job to fix those, those up. The third is another level again. Um, it, it's not part of my job, but I will do it. It's a, a sort of reluctance, etc., etc. And then the fourth is that the additional needs of families are part and parcel of my job. In other words, we start to look at our job and our responsibility with a broader lens to say it's not enough that I'm just a skilled early years professional and all I do is teach the children. That I have a responsibility also in my professional role if I want to make a difference for children and families of taking some additional responsibilities. That's not to say I'll always know what to do. It's not to say I'll always know what the problem is but I take responsibility for knowing there's something going wrong and making a referral to somebody who can make a difference. So the, the second uh, component of this different approach is around communities, around starting to engage with a community in a, a systematic way. And this is a slide I showed the other day. For those of you who speak Spanish, I'll leave it up for a moment. Eduardo Galeano, I think he's a Chilean um, a writer and philosopher. The only thing you make from up, down is holes. <laughs> and so much of policy, <laughs> so much of our policy <laughs> assumes that every community is exactly the same, that every service system is exactly the same. So if I'm a minister or I'm government and I see an issue, I'll introduce a program and, and I'll think that's the program for the whole country. And it doesn't work like that for a number of reasons, that communities resent top down. But secondly, we know that every single community everywhere in the world is different from the next community. There may be some similarities, but it's different in terms of its demographics, its service system, its transport system, et cetera, et cetera. So we, the way we start to work with community is we, we use data. So we map the existing service system. We, we, uh, not just the service system, but the resources. So we work with a community, identify some leadership, and they go around and they actually map all of the professionals are working in that community, all of the services are working in that community. So if you're an early years professional, you know exactly who can, who can help you, who can support you in that community. Then we document data. Data are very, very important because um, no data, no problem, no solution. Looking, looking at data bring people around the table who normally would not be there and it's an essential precursor to developing some sort of plan to improve uh, child outcomes. So I just want to give you an example of a very powerful data set that we've used in Australia. The Australian Early Developmental Index is an Australian adaptation of a Canadian instrument. 
And this is um, used in five-year-olds in the first year of schooling. So teachers in Australia, in every school, complete an online survey about the children in the first year of their formal schooling. It's all online. And we don't analyze individual child's data. We aggregate the data um, for schools, for communities, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the five subscales. And you're all professionals. You all work with young children. You would agree that a child needs to be competent or mature uh, in each of these areas in order to go on and have a successful learning experience. These are sort of intuitive. So we now have two waves of national data. So in our country, we have data on 97% of all Australian children, which is um, we are very proud of. It's a wonderful achievement. This is like a national census. But what's really important is this is then mapped. Uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you an example in a moment. Oops, sorry. Before I do that. Um, so in Australia, which is a, a high-income country, one in five children arrives at school developmentally vulnerable. One in five. So when people uh, saw these data, it shocked them because everybody thought, oh, yeah, there's a few kids with special needs and some children from poor backgrounds. But one in five Australian children arrives at school already vulnerable. This was shocking. So nobody in Australia can deny that we don't have to do something about that. So the beauty, and you can see the state breakdown from, very, from state to state. The beauty of the AEDI is that it's both an outcome of what happened in the first five years before children went to school, but it's also a base for what happens during school. And this has been the, the most powerful lever that we've ever had for focusing on early childhood because politicians and managers and academics and the community and the media are saying, well, what's happening to these children in the first five years that one in five arrives at school in trouble? So it's focused the lens now very firmly on those early years. And principals love that. Our strongest support comes from schools because when the principal of a school gets criticized for poor performance, poor reading scores, etc. He, he or she can say, no, no, we've got a very good school, we've got passionate teachers, look at the shape these children were in when they got to school. So there's a real focus now on early years. But we map communities, we use, we use geographic information system and we provide communities um, uh, with maps. And this is in the public domain, so you can go uh, onto the ADI website and, and just go through all of this data. What's important is that everybody in Australia, whether you're a principal or a parent or a policymaker or a minister, can just go online and look at how communities are doing. But what I wanted to highlight was this is a disadvantaged community, not close, to, not far from where I work. It's considered a disadvantaged community. Even within a disadvantaged community, you can see the variability. So dark green is not good, light green is good. So what is it about the dark green areas where children start school in so much worse shape than in the light areas. Now we can develop some hypotheses that are very, very valid, but if we present these data to the community, they will know exactly why there are these differences. So this has really strengthened, uh, to, to, uh, to my mind, the argument for universal services. Because if we, if we target only disadvantaged areas, we actually miss most kids with problems. And secondly, even within a disadvantaged community, you can see how different they are. You can see the variability. So this is a very strong argument for top-down does not work. We need to um, empower the community if we're going to make a difference. And these are very detailed quantitative, quantitative data we give back to community around uh, neighbourhoods, how their children are doing in terms of their development in a particular neighbourhood compared to the adjacent neighbourhood, compared to state norms, national norms, etc., etc. So this is the way we use data to start a conversation in communities to do things a bit differently. So communities get the ADI checklist, it helps them build a comprehensive picture of how children are doing in their area. Uh, they plan actions based on that. So they see 
uh, and there are surprises. So people come to the table who normally wouldn't be there. It brings the various sectors together to look at the data and ask questions. Why are we seeing these results? Well, that's puzzling, that's surprising, and that the start of that conversation is also the start of solutions. So they implement plans, and our centre does a lot of work with communities around the various methodologies. Then, three, then they evaluate, then three years later, the ADI gets repeated again, so they can actually see progress uh, over time. So this is uh, one of my favourite quotes, even though Henry Ford is not one of my favourite people. Coming together is a beginning, Staying together is progress. Working together is a success. So this is really about all of us getting out of our interdiscip interdisciplinary silos and starting to look more broadly and think of working with other people. So it's all about partnerships. And this is not, there's no manuals for how to do this. This is my own personal list. Start anywhere, start small. Start by just picking up the phone and making a phone call and saying to somebody, do you want to have coffee? It's as simple as that. That's where we start. It's not rocket science. You won't find, you may find manuals and things, but they're intuitive. You're not gonna learn anything that you don't already know. It's all about relationships. It's all about developing respectful relationships. And formal structures follow informal networks. It's very important to have MOUs and signed agreements. That's very, very important. But you don't have to wait for them. You can start with informal arrangements and then the written work, the paperwork will follow after that. And I would argue that intent and commitment is more important than money and resources. If you, if you want to do something, you'll find a way, even if the money isn't there. And I said this the other day, one of the terrible things about getting older is we realise there's no they. You know, why don't they do this? Why don't they fix this up? There's no they. We are the they. It's our responsibility to do something about it. And it takes time. So every evaluation of every service reform anywhere in the world, every single one has found it takes more time than is planned. And why it takes more time is that it's all about building relationships. And to build respectful relationships, you cannot shortchange that. That takes time. So we have to understand that if we care about our children and our own grandchildren, then we have to care about all children. It's not enough just to focus, to pick out some people that need extra help. This is a, a mainstream issue for everybody. Then finally, I just want to talk about some of the ways in which we've tried to translate the research. At the beginning I said that the challenge for us is to mainstream this. As long as early childhood development stays out there, just a group of you people, you know, uh, soft people working with young children, we're not going to get anywhere. How do we bring this into mainstream so it becomes core for uh, everybody? And we've been working on this for about 10 years now in our centre. Um, so this is, this is a systematic way in which uh, my centre has tried to translate the research. So what we're really interested in doing is translating the research so it informs public policy, service delivery, clinical practice, and parenting. And we've worked very, very hard for a long time now to develop strategies. And a lot of these things are available on our website. I don't mean to um, give an advertisement, but if you look at our website in my last slide, uh, almost all of these, these resources you can download, you can get on our mailing lists, and I would encourage you to do that to the extent they can support your work. I would love you to do that. So we're interested in policy makers using the best evidence to develop policy. And I won't go through this into detail, but there's a whole series of vehicles and strategies that we use. We're interested in practitioners and service providers using evidence. So again, we've got a whole... Um, uh, I'll show you some examples in a moment, a whole series of vehicles, training programs, handouts, websites, to make sure that individual practitioners and professionals have access to the evidence. And what translation means isn't that we put the research up there, but we translate it in such a way that it becomes accessible, that practitioners and policymakers and parents can use it in their everyday practice. And then finally, we want families to use the evidence. We want families to understand uh, how to create that best caretaking environment for young children and their families. So this is some examples. This is policy briefs. 
and you can sign up to get this. Uh, three or four times a year, we take an issue in early childhood and we translate the research um, in very policy relevant terms and we make this available electronically. And this has been very influential in our country and it, there's an international audience. So we're up to about edition 25, 26. So again, if you go onto our website, you can download all the previous uh, editions. This is a publication that's directed at community nurses. Uh, again, using evidence, translating evidence, because we want community nurses to know what the latest research is to inform their work. This is something that we send out to early uh, education professionals, um, early childhood uh, workers, carers, preschoolers, teachers, etc., etc. And I've shown this twice because that's a picture of my grandchildren on the front. <laughs> Uh, and then we do these round tables where we bring policymakers around the country to debate controversial issues to try and get a consensus and get on the same page. And this is our website. This is a government funded website um, that uh, we put on for parents and professionals to use it. I would encourage you to use it. Um, and even if you work in families and areas that don't understand English, there's a section there called Parenting in Pictures, where you can just download pictures about how to change nappies, how to breastfeed, etc., etc. Uh, and this is getting millions of hits, and I'm proud to say that it's won quite a number of international awards now for access and design. My favourite piece of this is a section called Baby Karaoke. <laughs> Because when we did the research with parents about what they wanted, quite a few parents were saying, well, they like to sing to their children, um, but they, they're conscious of their voice, they don't know the words, etc. So there's a pull-down menu of about 15 common songs, bar, bar, black sheep, and, um, with, with stick figures, so they can sing along to their, to their children. And then a, a series of posters that we've sent out to early year centres. This is one of my favourite ones. And this comes with a little uh, one page. So um, we've made this available. We had commercial sponsorship. So when a parent walks past this poster, oh, that's cute. It creates a, a teachable moment. It creates a, a window of opportunity for the earliest professionals to engage the parents in a conversation about the child's natural instincts to explore and curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got a national program for uh, encouraging parents to young children. So these are some examples of uh, what we've tried to do. For every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> so this is, in case I've, tr I've made this very, very simple, I w now want to take that away. This is extraordinarily difficult, challenging work. We've been doing this in my centre now for 10, 12, 15 years now, and we find it uh, stimulating, enlivening, and all of those things, but very, very challenging, because to change mainstream towards an appreciation about the research, about how important those early years are, is very, very difficult. And this is my next favourite one. I would not give a fig for simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. In other words, what we're trying to do is to take very, very complex issues, and I've tried to summarise the research simply, but the, the, the pathways are complex, the interventions are complex, um, and what we're trying to do, and what I would challenge you to do also, is to try and simplify that so people understand it. In our country, politicians aren't that smart. <laughs> And you have to simplify these sorts of complex things, and that's very challenging. But you know, even if we don't care about, ch even if we don't care about children, the economists are now coming to the table and arguing that investment in young children is the best investment that any country can make. And many of you have seen this slide or versions of this slide. James Heckman won the Nobel Prize. He's an economist. Uh, a decade ago for something I couldn't understand when I read it and I certainly can't remember now. He now goes around the world arguing for increased investment in young children. So Julius Richmond, who was the um, professor of paediatrics at Harvard when I was there many, many years ago, said, for sustainable solutions you need three things. One is we need the knowledge base. So we have a lot of knowledge now about the importance of those early years. We need political will, 
And in many countries now, people are starting to understand the importance of this. So many countries have really innovative policies. The third th thing is the social strategy, and that's uh, the interface where we're operating, and that's the challenge for you as well. You're seeing children and families, you're organising programs, you're, you're managing various things. It's the social strategy, that the interface that you have with parents and young children that becomes extraordinarily important. So this is the aim for us, that if we didn't... Ideally, we want every child to, to live uh, to his or her potential. That's the ideal developmental trajectory. We know that if we did nothing because of biological and environmental risk factors, many children would just fall away. But we do do something. Every country in the world, most countries in the world, do invest in early childhood to, to some extent. That's the red line, that current practice. But we have the knowledge now, at least in theory, to lift that red line to the green line. It's not as if we don't know what to do. And that's the opportunity we have as a country, as a group of professionals, um, as a planet, to really make a difference to all children. That's the developmental opportunity that all, ch all children really deserve the best start in life. Thank you very much.